this is the fourteen. Final spe speaker is uh, Nima Akani Hamed, and the title of this talk is from Old Physics to New Mathematics, from Old Baron Kassauer Dixon to Positive Geometry. I didn't say from all. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I said, sorry. No. No, we're all friends here, right? <laughs> But it, it really is a, a tremendous honor and a, and a privilege uh, to give a talk here uh, at this uh, wonderful celebration today. Um, uh, Zvi and uh, Lance and uh, David are amongst a handful of uh, uh, not just mine, but certainly uh, my heroes in this amazing field. Uh, many people have uh, remarked already, and I think we all know, uh, that this is an uh, exciting and um, fast-paced field that's, uh, over the last two decades, been expanding more and more to interact with uh, uh, more and more widely disparate uh, parts of uh, physics, ranging from uh, collider physics uh, all the way to uh, even pure mathematics, as, uh, as has been uh, at least some of the focus of the, of the program here. Um, and I myself am a relative newcomer uh, to this business, and uh, I was drawn in by the avalanche of uh, uh, advances that were going on around six years ago. Um, so first of all, uh, uh, Zvi, Lance, and David not only are not old, well, I don't know, biologically, uh, <laughs> but, they're, uh, but uh, that we're, we're not here to, uh, to uh, celebrate grand old men uh, who did their wonderful work a long time ago. And uh, um, in fact, they continue to be at the forefront of the most exciting recent advances. I think if you're going to give a Sakurai Prize for most exciting uh, developments in scattering amplitudes in the last five years, uh, uh, they would still be getting the prize. Um, but of course, they're much more special than that. Uh, it's one thing to do fantastic work in an area which is booming, uh, with a lot going on. Uh, and where everyone knows there's a lot going on. Uh, but it's quite something else uh, uh, to know that there's something there to begin with when not too many other people see it um, and dig it out and expose it through uh, brilliant work, uh, long-term uh, dedication and vision, and uh, persistence. Um, and, uh, uh, and, uh, I think in, in, in that regard, uh, 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 Zvi, Lance, and David are, I think, basically unique in this, in this field. Now, uh, of course, in the late 1980s, uh, there were some amazing bolts from the blue. And it's wonderful to have both Tom and uh, uh, Nair here um, to, uh, 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 to thank them for these bolts as well. Uh, there was the incredible Park-Taylor formula that's been written down a number of times. And I'll write it down again for uh, for scattering amplitudes of two gluons, uh, where everyone is plus helicity, but two guys are minus helicity. So there's this incredible one-line formula discovered by these guys. And of course, uh, Nair uh, realized it's a remarkable connection uh, to something that looked an awful lot like a string theory. Um, it, took, uh, it took 20 years before it was fully appreciated that these developments were a tip of a gigantic iceberg. Um, today, we know they're the tip of a gigantic iceberg. Back then, I think uh, I wasn't around, but um, I can tell you what I think my reaction would have been uh, back then. My reaction would have been, oh, this is all just some special business with uh, solutions that are close to, uh, uh, because there's two negative helicity gluons, these are very, very closely related to self-dual solutions of the Yang-Mills equation. So of course, classically, self-dual sector is integrable. This is all just a very, very special thing. You don't see the simplicity uh, beyond the simplest MHV amplitudes. Uh, loop amplitudes look like a monster. That's where all the real juice is. That's where you can't be protected from all the classical physics is going on at loops. So there's probably nothing going on here. That's, that's, that's probably would have been my, uh, my, my, my reaction. Um, 
Now, and I think it's probably the reaction of a lot of people. It's a natural reaction among theoretical physicists, right? Because at any given time, there's all sorts of interesting things going on, things that other people are doing and things that you're doing. And if, especially if someone else is coming along with something that looks really exciting, uh, in order to justify not dropping everything you have and working on it, you have to sort of start inventing these reasons why what they're doing is irrelevant or crap, <laughs> right? And we all, I mean, it's a, it's a very human thing. It's a very human thing. It's a very natural thing. Uh, I think everyone does it to some extent, and really good people eventually, you know, will will, will realize that they're fooling themselves and start uh, and start changing their tune if it's uh, if it's uh, appropriate. Really bad people, well, we won't talk about them. Okay, uh, um, but um, that's that's probably what what. But anyway, that, I think it was not at all obvious that this was the tip of a huge iceberg. Um, uh, but of course, what. Uh, 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 what Zvielans and uh, uh, David did was uh, start exposing incredible simplicity and structure in scattering amplitudes at loop level. And I think that's, that's something where it became, it starts becoming much, much harder to imagine that it's all because of some uh, accidents of, uh, of, of classical uh, equations. Uh, something else that, that they did, uh, one of many, many things, is pioneer thinking about N equals four super Yang mills as, uh, as the laboratory. I mean, today we're all like, oh yes, N equals four, oh yes, N equals four. It was not at all obvious. Uh, I mean, certainly I remember hearing about these things as a student. It wasn't obvious that, that, that maximal supersymmetry was gonna help with amplitudes. I mean, you knew that supersymmetry helped solve the hierarchy problem and there's cancellations, but, but this is a different part of the physics, right? This is infrared stuff. Now you have all this extra crap running around loops. Why should, we, why should this be better, right? Um, in fact, I remember, I, I think it was a talk I saw of, of Lance's when I was a postdoc at Slack, where there was this idea of decomposing QCD in terms of the n equals four part and subtracting the other parts. And I'm like, wow, that's a totally screwy way of doing it, but okay, I got you. Yeah, so, that, that, so I mean, it, it's not at all an obvious thing to do. And pioneering the realization that there was a, a remarkable structure in uh, n equals four is also something that, uh, for n equals four amplitudes is something that we have to, uh, we have to, uh, uh, thank them for. So, um, so let me, I'm not going to write very many uh, equations on the blackboard, but let me just write the sort of counterpart of that formula. Uh, if this is the uh, tree amplitude, then the one loop amplitude that uh, these guys found is the tree amplitude times uh, an incredibly simple sum of basic uh, loop integrands. Uh, these famous two mass easy boxes. Um, and uh, as I said, that the fact that, uh, that now something where everything is going on, you're summing over all virtual contributions, everything, and the fact that it still collapses to such an incredibly beautiful and, uh, and mysteriously beautiful formula uh, was very, very hard to uh, uh, ignore. This is true for all n. Um, uh, they also gave us these beautiful pictures for four particle scattering. You know, again, today th th these are like mother's milk to those of us in the amplitude business. But why should you draw, just draw diagrams with little boxes? Why aren't there weirder shapes? Why don't, uh, why don't we have all, if we're going to multi-loops, why don't we have some crazy hexagon inside? Why, they could have all sorts of weird stuff going on. No, they just drew little diagrams with uh, little, little boxes. So, so uh, that's the, that's the two-loop uh, amplitude. The three-loop amplitude are little ladders like this. I won't draw uh, their flips over. And, uh, and the uh, tennis court diagram, and, and so on. And uh, what we saw a great example from uh, Lance of what the six-point uh, integrand uh, looks like. But again, it's not at all obvious that they should even be expressed in this form, uh, and yet not only they're expressed in this form, but they, but they come out just in, a, in this absolutely beautiful way. Uh, and there are also other, other related ideas that the, the, the fact, and the, uh, here there are other people who said similar things, but, but, uh, but, but, but our friends uh, 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 emphasized strongly that the final answers here had this remarkable property of having leading transcendentality. That's something, uh, uh, again, not at all manifest, not at all obvious uh, uh, ahead of time. All these things, um, all these things, I think, uh, we're screaming out that something big is going on, okay? Um, and, uh, and what I find particularly uh, impressive about uh, 
uh, about uh, their work in, in, in this period. And they, I'd love to, uh, to hear from them more about their, their, their sense of, 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 the, of this history. Um, but, you know, uh, again, often fields, uh, other fields have what you might call profits. Um, and uh, and there's, I think, uh, an, uh, usually an excessive amount of reverence for these, for these prophets. Because the, the, the prophets tend to have the property that they say some sort of vague things. I won't name any names, but, but you can probably figure out the sort of collection of people I'm talking about. They say some sort of vague things about what might happen with physics in the future, right? And then 20 years later, when other people have done all the hard work and they've really figured out what's going on and how it works in detail and why it works that way and not another way, if it vaguely looks like something they did, they say, see, I said so all along, <laughs> right? Um, and, and they have a fair amount of attraction. I think it's because a lot of physicists have, have father figure issues. But, uh, <laughs> uh, but, um, uh, but anyway, uh, Zvi and Lance and, and David were very much not like that. They weren't just vague prophets saying something was going on. They were extremely specific. There was something interesting going on in this area with these kind of computations in this, uh, in this arena. And they knew it. Um, and it took uh, a decade for the, uh, uh, a decade or more for many other people uh, in, in the field to uh, catch up and uh, realize it. All right, so, uh, so what allowed uh, all of this to happen? Uh, what allowed this uh, progress in understanding uh, loop amplitudes to uh, take place? Well, it's been mentioned uh, already, of course, um, but, but it was this uh, uh, amazing set of techniques and ideas surrounding uh, generalized unitarity. And uh, something that uh, uh, I think uh, uh, maybe could be emphasized even more, more strongly than, than, uh, than it was, is what a uh, what an, uh, non-trivial combination of two completely different philosophies about field theory uh, was involved in making use of generalized unitarity. On the one hand, using thinking about discontinuities and unitarity and so on was part of the S-matrix program, famously, right? Uh, but the S-matrix program people never wanted to talk about Feynman diagrams, ever. They were just computing the S-matrix, and therefore they were talking about unitarity and exploiting unitarity at the level of the final answer. Okay? At the level of the final answer, this is a very hard business. Okay? This is a very hard business that um, actually only today we are just in the context of planar n equals 4, again with our friends uh, together with many of the younger colleagues at the forefront of developing it, just being able to start exploiting the actual discontinuities of, of the answer using these fancy techniques from polylogarithms and symbols and so on and so forth in order to really realize the old school S matrix program uh, to uh, determine the amplitude from its uh, discontinuities. But it's still a tough business. Okay? It's, it's still a tough business and it really requires an enormous amount of, uh, of, uh, uh, of um, uh, uh, mathematical and, and physical sophistication to be able to make use of it. Okay, so that was, but that was the philosophy of the S matrix theorists. Don't show me a Feynman diagram. Okay? On the other hand, there are the Feynman diagram people. And the Feynman diagram people, uh, you know, it, it's funny, in, uh, uh, we, have this big, uh, we have this big mythology of how the S matrix came into dominance and then it crashed and burned when field theory took over, right? So why the hell would you ever go back and think about what these silly S matrix people were uh, talking about? So what was fascinating about, uh, about uh, the, the, the BDK introduction of generalized unitarity is that they took both points of view seriously. They thought about uh, discontinuities and cuts, but in the context of what they knew about the structure of the final answer when expressed in terms of Feynman diagrams, that, uh, that at least to start with that one loop uh, told, told us ahead of time that the answer was expressed in terms of a particular basis of uh, integrals. Now, even before, of course, so this is the old part of the physics, uh, of course, even before BDK, going back to textbooks, we had the aptly named Mr. Kodkowski. I think that's how you, maybe I, maybe I shouldn't spell it. <laughs> Mr. Kodkowski, okay, uh, who realized that, uh, that, that the unitarity of, that the unitarity of, uh, of uh, loop amplitudes was related to a nice property of the integrand. Okay, so and 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 it's it's a statement that on a double cut, uh, we should think of the amplitude as uh, factorizing that way and integrating over the on-shell phase space of two particles. Okay, 
And if you, if you, uh, you know, take a random grad student and put a gun to their head and say, what does unitarity mean? If they're any good, they'll draw that picture, okay? <laughs> so uh, if, if they're bad, they're dead, okay? <laughs> So unitarity means double cuts. Okay, that's uh, that's that's what that's what unitarity means. And uh, so, what is this generalized unitarity about? Well, generalized unitarity uh, makes like practical and good sense when you have in mind some set of uh, some set of integrals that the answer is expressed in terms of. And when you have that in mind, then you can start doing other things. You can start talking about cuts that don't have, on the face of it, anything to do with s dagger s equals one. Okay? They instead have to do with the fact that, uh, that uh, if the answer has at most four propagators in it somewhere, then it makes sense to put three of them on shell. And uh, when you put the three of them on shell, the object that you have has got to look like gluing three tree amplitudes together at one loop. So a generalized unitarity person will start drawing pictures like this. I have no idea what s dagger s equals one question would correspond to, uh, to, uh, to even staring at that guy. Um, but it's this, as I said, it's this, uh, it's this combination of thinking from the uh, s matrix point of view as well as from the Feynman diagram point of view that, uh, that, that led to uh, exploiting this. Uh, and of course, you know, then once, once you have this, you, of course you can keep on going, you can go to two loops, you can start looking at cuts like this. You cut everything in sight, for example. Okay? Um, and again, that's, that's some singularity of the two-loop uh, integrand determined by gluing together, uh, determined by gluing together uh, those uh, tree amplitudes. Okay, so, um, <coughs> uh, and uh, uh, something else uh, I think that, that was uh, uh, that was very important, especially in, in, in these early days, was the realization that you could extend these ideas to four minus epsilon dimensions and use them to even determine the rational terms of amplitudes, which naively are sort of mysterious things that sit there without any cuts, playing no role whatsoever in s dagger s equals one. Okay, so that's a particularly extreme case of uh, using these uh, beautiful ideas to get something that uh, that uh, that. Uh, uh, that, that isn't really even close to, uh, to the uh, standard picture of uh, unitarity. All right, now, behind all of these things was another uh, uh, very important idea that we should focus on the integrand. Okay, so I said it already, but the fact that you can uh, uh, make progress by uh, I isolating and studying the integrand rather than the final amplitude was uh, 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 was 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 key, and incidentally, th this this has another wonderful uh, uh, feature, which of course we see now even without in all aspects of this field, um, uh, uh, with or without integrands, but but having the integrand is a particularly nice one. The integrand is a relatively simple object; it's a rational function that depends on loop momentum variables and external kinematical variables. And so, all of a sudden, the sort of question of uh, computing the amplitudes that at first sight sees some very complicated thing already starts feeling a little bit more manageable. You're just looking for some big rational function out there, right? Um, and it also has another wonderful feature, which is that while it can be very hard to get it using Feynman diagrams or any other technique, if someone hands you the integrand, you can check whether it's right. And that's one of the big, big features of work in the amplitude business, we have constant checks on our ideas. Okay? Uh, remember, the purpose in life of Feynman diagrams is to make locality of interactions in space-time and unitarity manifest. Okay? So if we're, if we're computing things that way, uh, then we can be sure the answer is local and unitary, and we can spend hundreds of pages of algebra getting it. Okay? If we're going to get the answer some other way, then those things are not going to be totally manifest, and so we have to check them. And so uh, checking locality, and uh, in this case, uh, unitarity, uh, 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 at the level of uh, generalized unitarity is an incredibly powerful constraint on that uh, rational function, uh, which, uh, of course, uh, uh, Zvi, Lentz, and David used to a, a great effect in, in solving for the, for, for the uh, loop amplitudes, not just for n equals 4 super Yang mills, but, uh, but beyond. Um, now, so this basic idea of generalized unitarity, looking not just at the double cuts, but all the cuts, and, and the thought that all the cuts are meaningful and important and that, the, and that they should be studied, uh, this um, 
Uh, of course, I've done uh, many, many other things. But this particular idea has been essentially the only thing I've worked on in this subject for the last six years, okay? uh, trying to make sense of the structure of the cuts of the integrand in n equals 4 super Yang mills, uh, okay, every now and then uh, something else, but mostly in uh, planar n equals 4 super Yang mills. Already that little baby, baby example uh, has illustrated an incredible structure, okay? that, that really thinking about all the cuts uh, you can get in n equals 4, um, first, definitely, uh, definitely supports the idea there's something important about these cuts. And along the way, it's exposed connections going from old physics to new mathematics. It's exposed connections to these wonderful areas in algebraic geometry that our algebraic geometer friends have been developing over the last uh, number of uh, years independently, uh, sort of amazingly independently, that these things are coming up uh, simultaneously for totally different reasons. Um, uh, related to ideas uh, about positivity uh, in the Grassmannian and so on that I will, uh, I will, I will uh, quickly review in a moment. But before saying more about it, uh, I, I want to uh, say something else about um, this, uh, uh, this joint use of ideas from two philosophically opposite uh, sides of uh, field theory. Um, it's, it's, it's an illustration of a general uh, um, fact about the scientific character of our of our friends, uh, they are not ideologues. Okay? Um, they will use uh, every tool needed uh, to make progress, and they don't care where it comes from. Okay? They are not ideologues. Uh, are you are you an ideologue? Is that why you're laughing? Do, do I not know something? No. no, no. A, yeah. Just remi remembering, I was uh, primitive and you're chewing me up using Feynman diagrams. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Exactly. 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 They're, they're so not idealized, they wouldn't even fucking apologize for it, you know, when they, when they go back to Yeah, that was just me. That's right. That's right. That was just me. That was just me. Very good. Um, now, and, and I'm, I must say, uh, and I'm, I'm really not just, just saying this to say it, I'm very uh, envious of this. Because I am an ideologue, okay? Um, and, uh, well, uh, but, but the, uh, in, in my defense, at least I can say I'm a serial ideologue, in the sense that I'll take totally different ideologies um, uh, uh, and drop the last one without thinking about it. Uh, but it's very important for me personally to be an ideologue when I'm working on something. And I think, uh, and I'm saying this in all honesty, I think the, the, uh, the difference is talent. If you're really good, you don't have to be an ideologue. Yeah, you take this, you take that, you just, uh, you're just you solving for things left and right. You don't care where things come from. If you're not as good, there's 15 million things going on. You're holding on for dear life and the stiff wind of all the crazy stuff going on in, in the subject. And so you have to have a strong point of view about something. You have to have a strong point of view to sort of uh, pursue a particular direction. Otherwise, you'll get bat beaten around all the time and, and, and get nowhere. So. You know, so usually I'll get up uh, when I talk about scattering amplitudes and give a, and give a, a long introduction about how space-time is doomed and we have to find some way of uh, thinking about quantum field theory without local evolution in space-time and maybe even without a Hilbert space and blah, blah, blah. And uh, this is all very highfalutin stuff. This is stuff that Lance wouldn't be caught dead saying, okay? Uh, and, uh, and uh, you know, they, 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 not, I think none of these guys would ever say say something that sounds so pretentious. But I, but I, I have to say it. You know, I have to say it because this is this is uh, this is the only way I can get up in the morning. I'm like, I suck again. <laughs> okay, here we go. I'm doing it because space time is zoomed. I swear to God, right? You know, it's, uh, uh, but um, but uh, it, uh, but but quite 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 seriously, um, uh, the, the 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 best people on the subject have have this uh, feature. They don't need to be ideologues, and they take the most interesting ideas from every direction they can, and they use them uh, to make progress. So I really am quite uh, quite envious of that. All right. So uh, let me now uh, illustrate the sort of evolution of the ideas of uh, uh, generalized unitarity. Um, and how it ends up relating to uh, positive geometry, uh, first via the idea of the positive Grassmannian, and more recently uh, via the uh, geometric object that we call the amplitudron, um, uh, the first paper on which has just been posted at 4 o'clock today. So it should come out uh, early uh, next week on, on Tuesday. Um, so, uh, in order to do that, uh, let me actually just go back to talk about the simplest uh, um, uh, loop 
diagram of all just the uh, just 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 a massless box. So and I'm working in just momentum space. So we know what this is. It's d4l over l squared l plus oops. Let's see. L plus p1 squared, L plus p1 plus p2 squared, and let's say L minus p4 squared. And we can put some numerator factor here to normalize it uh, in some convenient way. All right, so that's what that's what we have. We integrate it. We get we get uh, we get something. Right? It's IR divergent. Blah 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 blah. But uh, but interesting things start happening when you think of this as a rational function. It says a rational function is a little bit spiffy. Right? It has these uh, quadratic uh, poles and so on and so forth. Um, and so you can start imagining what happens. So, uh, so uh, a generalized unitarity would proceed by saying, what happens when I cut that line, which is like saying put L squared equals 0. So that puts one constraint on the L. So now you go from like a, uh, uh, like from a four form to a three form. We have a three-dimensional integral to do on the single cut. Then you can cut another one. You can cut another one and so on. Right? And, uh, even that little thing has an incredibly rich structure. Even this guy has an incredibly rich structure. Um, now, uh, if your goal in life is to uh, use these things to determine uh, the integrand for an amplitude, uh, you don't have to study all of its singularities all the way down in infinite detail. But if you start studying all of its singularities all the way down in infinite detail, you start revealing a sort of remarkable structure, even in this little guy. Okay? This little guy. All of its singularities are in one-to-one -one correspondence with the so-called cells of the positive Grassmannian G24. Okay, it's already a pretty fancy thing, just this little box. And uh, I, I won't explain how it works in detail, but let me just give some uh, flavor for how it works. See, there's something that's not so obvious when you just stare at this guy. Um, well, it's one of those things that if you're super dumb, you think is obvious. Then if you're more sophisticated, you think is impossible. Then if you're even more sophisticated, you see is possible. Okay? So if you're super dumb, you say, hey, this is really simple. This is like, this is like you know, 1 over x, 1 over y, 1 over z, 1 over w. So this is like, uh, uh, you would think it's like uh, uh, d log l squared, d log l plus b1 squared. Okay? So you think that, that, this, that this thought of as a 4 form, you would think is just d log of L squared d log, just all the propagators, L plus p1 squared, d log L plus p1 plus p2 squared, d log L minus p4 squared. Okay, so then you go and you show that to your advisor, uh, if you're a student, and then they say, you're such an idiot, what does d log L squared mean? That it has units, right? You can't just write down d log L squared. So that's just obviously crap, right? And it's true. It is crap, and that's just wrong. Uh, they might come back and say, well, can I put some other L minus something squared downstairs? L minus some p star squared downstairs? And you say, yeah, uh, knock yourself out. Um, there we go. Now you're going to get something that depends on that crappy p star. Okay? So you're not talking about the same guy again, right? But now, now uh, uh, if, you, if you start thinking about it a little more deeply, there is a preferred value of p star. Okay? And that is, that's, that's related to one of the uh, wonderful things about this box, which is that if you put all four propagators to 0, if you put all four propagators to 0, you find there is actually two solutions, two L's for which uh, you get to put all four guys on shell. They're complex in general. But you choose either one of the two of them in that denominator, and that equality is correct. Okay. So that should impress you a little bit, right? Even this little tiny little box is something really simple in some different variables. Okay? There are some different set of variables where the box is just d log, d log, d log, d log. OK. And you might wonder where this is coming from. Now, this is actually something that ends up being true for n equals 4 super Yang mills. The final integrand for the amplitude can be written as a sum of a whole bunch of terms, each one of which is just d logs. Right? It's not at all obvious. It wasn't even obvious here, never mind at the, at the higher loops. But it's true. Uh, and 
But on the other hand, you see, once it's d-logs, it's sort of very easy to see what the singularity structure is, right? Just each one of the logs can, uh, each one of the d-logs has some singularity at zero and infinity. You can very easily trace out what it all looks like. Having put it in d-log form, you've exposed as much as possible all the singularity structures. Not just a few that are immediately necessary for single cut, double cuts, triple cuts, but all of them, all the way down, are, are made uh, manifest by finding these, uh, these d-log uh, representatives. <clears throat> now, um, uh, before moving on to, uh, before moving on to uh, uh, talking about uh, how we can systematically understand where these d-log forms come from, let me just mention one other thing. Um, which is that uh, we've also learned, especially for planar diagrams in the last number of years, uh, that it's really useful to think of these diagrams in a, in, 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 in a different way, in terms of some module diagram, which is just nothing other than saying that we say that L is equal to x minus x1, and then each one of the momenta, like, uh, 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 for example, P1, is x2 minus x1, and so on. Okay. Uh, if, we, if we write it that way, then uh, this form is just d4 is a little more symmetrical looking over x minus x1 squared over x minus x4 squared. So far, there's nothing particularly deep going on. We're just, uh, it, it, especially with planar diagrams, it's, it's convenient to do this. But it's just a trivial linear change of variable from l to x, completely trivial. Okay. Um, something which is less trivial. Uh, and, and very beautiful is, is the use of twister variables uh, to make uh, all of this, uh, uh, to make the structure of the integrand and actually the sort of geometric uh, underpinnings of these integrands much more transparent. And I, I'm not going to have time to explain this in uh, detail, uh, but I'll just tell you what the, what the sort of words are. So the idea is that every point, every x in this space time, is associated with a line in a three dimensional projective space. And if you have two points that are null separated from each other, the two lines, oh, so the conformal group in four dimensions is, uh, if you complexify it, is SL4. So, uh, so points in this three-dimensional space-time are just, just four-dimensional vectors, uh, which I identify uh, with uh, an overall rescaling. So it's a three-dimensional projective space. Uh, but a line in this space. Uh, of course, uh, is associated with a point in space-time. And if you have two points that are null separated, the corresponding lines intersect each other. Okay, so associated with this picture is then four lines, one of which intersects the next. Whoops. Well, let's say if I had five points, it would be uh, five lines, one of which intersects the next. And so I can completely specify uh, the uh, null momenta of the external particles by giving these intersection points. So these are the momentum twister variables of uh, uh, Hodges. Okay. But actually, if we go back, uh, if we go back here, um, then <clears throat> then we can also uh, think about the integration point. Integrating over x can be uh, instead of integrating over x, we can think of it as integrating over lines in momentum twister space. So integral of d4x is replaced by integrals over lines AB. So we, we often call a line AB by imagining that we're just giving two points A and B on it. And, uh, and in fact, there's a simple measure that looks, looks like that. This, this formula is not quite right, uh, but uh, it's proportional. All right. So it means that we can think of the loop integrand now as a form which depends on uh, this line AB. Now, in this twister language, um, in this twister language, uh, let's say you want to integrate over uh, uh, this line. Well, for instance, we have some natural planes. Uh, the, I can parameterize a line by where it, where it intersects the plane 1, 2, 3, and where it intersects the plane uh, uh, 3, 4, 1, let's say. Um, so that means that I can, for instance, expand A as 1 plus alpha 2 plus alpha uh, 2 plus beta 4, and B as 3 plus gamma 2 plus rho 4. Okay? That's just uh, parameterizing. This line AB, where does it intersect the plane 
4, 1, 2, and that's A, and where does it intersect the plane? 2, 3, 4, that's B. And now, the, the nice thing about this is it makes it, uh, is what looks like a relatively, already somewhat something kind of quadratic and juicy in L space, and these variables just directly turns into that D log 4. So that's the one loop integrand in this form. This is a very early hint that, that, uh, that the structure of the integrand is really transparent and really, uh, uh, and, and the geometry is very clear uh, when you think in the momentum twister language. It's not crucial. You could do everything back in X space or even original L space, but it makes thinking about the geometry uh, quite a bit clearer. All right. So, um, <coughs> so let's let's get back to uh, uh, what happened uh, to the pursuit of uh, uh, generalized unitarity. If you want to pursue, uh, if if you want to take the idea of looking at the cuts very seriously and thinking about all the cuts. Then uh, it's natural to finally imagine if you cut and you cut and you cut. Um, uh, you see, what, what, when we cut a few things, we take a big integral and we relate it to products of lower point uh, uh, amplitudes. Now, even at tree level, you can have a sort of a vague notion of a cut by taking a factorization channel. You have a big tree amplitude. You can go to a place where you force some of the intermediate lines to go on shell. If you do that, then it also splits. Okay? So, so somehow, if you keep making finding singularities and finding more and more and more singular configurations, you should be able to take any big complicated process and break it up eventually to gluing together the simplest basic building block amplitudes there are. And the simplest building block amplitudes are the three-point amplitudes. Okay. And for any theory of massless particles, there are two uh, three-particle amplitudes that are, uh, that are associated with different, uh, it, for three particles, the only way to have uh, momentum conservation is to have these spinner helicity variables uh, let's say just the lambdas or the lambda tildes to be all proportional to each other. So this configuration for three particles is a white vertex, that one's a black vertex, and these are associated in gauge theories with these helicity configurations. Okay? And the overall, the amplitude is just completely determined by Poincaré symmetry. There's nothing you can do about it. Okay? Up to the overall strength. So once you have these amplitudes, uh, again, if you're, perp if you're, if you're uh, obsessed with uh, looking at the cuts all the way down, um, uh, you start gluing them together. You say that any cut you can ever imagine getting has got to, in the end of the day, look like putting together black and white vertices in some way. Okay? And this pursuit of, uh, this pursuit of uh, thinking about what the uh, singularity structure looks like from different points of view uh, was really uh, was, was, was pioneered and, and pushed from a, a number of different perspectives by Freddy Cachazzo and uh, Andrew Hodges, who was doing this for 30 years uh, beforehand without, uh, uh, without many of us, many people realizing that, that these ideas were uh, uh, related to each other. Okay? Uh, and so the importance of, of staring at these kind of uh, objects and studying them and using them to determine uh, amplitudes and giving on-shell representations of amplitude and so on really goes back to those guys in, uh, in, in, in one way or another. <clears throat> okay. So, um, but uh, uh, in this work that we did last year, we sort of just put the systematics behind uh, this, uh, this uh, picture. All right. So, uh, 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 and by the way, in these pictures, whenever there is an internal line, I'm imagining just doing the on the on shell phase space integral over the intermediate line. Okay, so there's nothing here which is virtual. There's nothing off shell. Okay, these are uh, there are on shell diagrams. They correspond to on shell processes. And again, in an earlier incarnation, these are also known as twister diagrams. All right. 
Now, the interesting thing turns out to be um, that, uh, uh, that you can actually um, represent the actual amplitudes directly in terms of on-shell processes. And of course, the sort of 90% of this is implicit. 90% of this is implicit in the work going back to a BDK, that you use on-shell information to determine the amplitude. You never have to do any off-shell calculation. You don't use any on-shell, uh, uh, you, you don't use anything other than on-shell information to get the amplitude. Um, uh, the little bit more that we added is, is the sort of, is the realization that you don't, that, that you can just directly represent the actual integrand as some on-shell object. Okay? Not, uh, not uh, just using on-shell information to get the off-shell integrand, but the integrand is itself something on-shell. Okay? Um, now, actually, we can illustrate this already at tree level. So uh, let's say you were to glue these guys together. Um, and you thought it might have something to do, see, at the moment, this is only of academic interest. But, uh, but, uh, but what, I'm, what I'm now saying is that these are actually related to the actual amplitudes. So what might you think <coughs> would be related to, let's say, the tree amplitude? Well, the, the dumbest thing you would do is draw that. You say, is that the tree amplitude, right? Um, <coughs> but that can't be the tree amplitude. That can't be the tree amplitude because, it, because that intermediate guy has got to be on shell. So this thing vanishes for generic external momenta. So, in fact, this is a factorization channel. It's not, uh, it's, not a, uh, uh, it's not the actual amplitude. When we draw Feynman diagrams, of course, we have these two different channels, and we need two different diagrams to see the S and the T channel singularities that the amplitude has. Right? So you might expect, no matter what we do, that we're going to have two different diagrams. But in fact, there's a single on-shell diagram that represents the tree amplitude. And it's that guy. That way of gluing together uh, three particle amplitudes, uh, this is the four particle amplitude. Okay? Um, and in fact, uh, uh, the fact that all the internal guys are null and momentum conservation actually locks all of these internal momenta. So no matter what external data you give, uh, everything here is locked and you just get a, ra a rational function out of this and that's the four particle tree amplitude. Right? But uh, where, do these, where do these factorization channels sit? You see, what, what's, 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 what's going on here? Remember I told you that the lambdas or the lambda tildes have got to be proportional. So, uh, so if this is 1, 2, 3, 4, uh, that guy says that the lambda of this intermediate line has got to be proportional to 1. That says the lambda tilde has got to be proportional to 2. So whatever's going on in there, it's some z lambda 1, lambda tilde 2. Okay? So there's just one variable associated with that uh, internal guy. And no matter what the external momentum is, the guy going in here is deformed somehow by that z going out. This is, of course, precisely the uh, BCFW deformation. Okay. Um, but as you're hunting around 1, let's say you happen to land on the place where automatically 1, 4 would have been on a factorization channel. That means that that z vanishes. Right? So finding uh, factorization channels of this guy corresponds to erasing edges in the picture. And so you see what happens. Uh, you can erase that edge, and that exposes the S-channel factorization. You can erase one of these edges, and that exposes the T-channel factorization. And that's how this one object actually has all of the singularities of the theory in it. And it turns out that when you appropriately interpret it, this is the one-loop amplitude. Just for four particles expressed in on-shell terms. Okay? You just add four of these little bridges to the outside of the tree. So we added four extra variables here. Those four variables are the four variables you need, L0, L1, L2, L3. Except it's produced in a form that when you do this computation, each edge goes along with a d log of an edge variable associated with it. And so that picture is directly producing the answer in this form, the d log, d log, d log form. Now, the amplitudes uh, the cut structure that the amplitudes have to have in order to reflect locality and unitarity is something schematically like this. Okay? It says that, it, that the, the first singularities of the amplitude are either a factorization channel 
or the so-called forward limit of a one lower loop amplitude. Okay? So uh, this, is a, this is a completely sensible statement in planar n equals four super Yang mills, and actually uh, probably all the way down to even n equals one uh, supersymmetry. Okay? So, um, and you can generalize the idea of BCF and W to then use this information to determine uh, the integrand itself. Okay? Um, and you do that just by adding one variable, sort of like what, what we did here, right? Here, that's what the factorization looks like. And then uh, by deforming it, by adding this little hat on top of it, you actually get the full amplitude. So similarly here, we can get the amplitude itself by summing over all the ways of decomposing this into a left and a right by something where you add a hat to it like that. And similarly, at loop level, by adding a little hat like that. And this gives an explicit way of decomposing, of, of giving the amplitude directly as a sum of unshell pieces, okay? of, of uh, unshell diagrams. <clears throat> All right. So it does or it doesn't matter which pair you choose? But this little it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. And you can do it any way. You can do it any way you like. Yeah. So uh, yeah, that's right. So you have to pick out an n and a 1. And you have to be consistent, OK? Um, but then you can keep, keep going any way, any way you want. All right. So, so that, that, that just tells you that it's possible to represent the integrand. It's possible to represent the integrand purely as sums of on-shell processes. So that increases your desire to study these on-shell guys and see what their, see what their uh, properties are, perhaps. <clears throat> and OK. So this is something. This is something uh, uh, we did, and I won't, uh, and I won't uh, uh, really review how it works, but I'll just tell you that it turns out that there's a, that just as a physicist, if you go off trying to compute these guys, see, if you're very naive, um, you think it's uh, not very naive. It's true. It looks, it looks like that the hard part is going to be there's some quadratic constraint here. Like, let's say the internal guys are on shell. That's a quadratic constraint. Or if you use spinholicity variables, then, then everyone is, uh, manifestly, uh, everyone's manifestly on shell in between. But then momentum conservation at the vertices is a quadratic constraint. Okay? So there's a non-trivial constraint involved. But there is, there's a way of uh, more nicely representing even these basic building block three-particle amplitudes um, in a way that, that connects the computation of these on shell processes to the Grassmannian. So in other words, uh, associated with the computation of, of a diagram like this, um, uh, you end up uh, putting uh, variables associated with the edges of these diagrams. Okay? And the computation of the final answer uh, involves constructing, associated with one of these diagrams, some k by n matrix. K just ends up being the overall K charge of, of, uh, uh, of, this, uh, uh, of this collection of uh, black and white vertices. But to compute it, you end up having a K by N matrix C that depends on all these, on all these uh, uh, edge variables. Okay. And furthermore, the computation of that form is actually associated uh, with a very, very simple form, which is uh, just the D log of all of these edge variables. Okay. And finally, and quite uh, remarkably, uh, it turns out that, uh, that uh, if you imagine these edge variables are real and positive, that this k by n matrix isn't just a random k by n matrix, but it's positive. Uh, in the sense that uh, if you take any, uh, if you take uh, any ordered columns, any k of the ordered columns, and you take its determinant, uh, it is positive. So there is a correspondence between these on-shell processes and this uh, nice structure on the space of k by n matrices modulo an overall GLK action, which is this uh, Grassmannian. Uh, uh, there's a correspondence between these on-shell diagrams and uh, the so-called positive Grassmannian. That's, yeah. K charge. Yes. 
the k charge is the same as the, 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 the k charge here is, is the number of negative helicity gluons. Okay? So it's a super amplitude, but it's a sector with the k negative helicity gluons. Okay. Absolutely, yes. Although, although here, uh, here I'm back in the original momentum space, and the other one, the other picture was in the momentum twister space, but you can map from one, one, one to the other. Okay. All right, so, um, so I'm not going to explain much more uh, how it works in detail, other than to say that, so, so first, uh, that, I mean, the, 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 the connection is, uh, it's, not a, it's not an obvious connection. Um, it, it, it turns out that, uh, that even this, this geometry is uh, really determined essentially by some very simple combinatorics. Okay, so there's, uh, there, there's, some, there's, some wonderful, there's some wonderful mathematics on this side. But what we see is then, this is the old physics to new mathematics, right? We start from Kutkowski through to generalized unitarity is the key idea for uh, imagining looking not just at the double cuts, but all the cuts, and then taken to its logical extreme, studying all the possible cuts, ends up reconstructing this incredible structure, in, uh, incredible and beautiful structure in algebraic geometry that the mathematicians have just been exploring themselves, as I said, over the past five, six years for completely different reasons. Okay, now, so in a sense, um, in a sense, this whole construction, I mean, we could have just stopped here with these on-shell diagrams, it's the answer, uh, but, but computing them turns out to be most naturally done associating with the Grassmannian and seeing the rest of the structure. Um, one thing I should have said is it's this connection that allows you to see piece by piece, each one of those on-shell diagrams exhibits a symmetry of n equals four super Yang mills that you don't see in Feynman diagrams. You don't see in any other way, okay? Uh, in fact, each term, piece by piece, is invariant not only under conformal transformations, but famously under the dual conformal transformations. Uh, uh, Zvi and Lance and uh, uh, Smirnov played a key role in discovering dual superconformal symmetry uh, to begin with. Um, but uh, uh, but uh, uh, th there are many different formulations of thinking about uh, scattering amplitudes. You can think of a scattering amplitude in one space time, you can think of a Wilson loop in a dual space time. But there wasn't a picture for what is the way of decomposing the amplitude where you see all the symmetries at once. Okay? And the answer is this. This is the way of decomposing the amplitudes where you see all the symmetries at once. Each one of these building blocks coming from just gluing together basic uh, uh, three-point amplitudes sees all the symmetries. And to see that it sees all the symmetries, the connection with the Grassmannian is crucial. Okay? In fact, the conformal and dual conformal symmetries close into this infinite dimensional Yangian symmetry. And you could ask, why would, you ever, why would you even suspect that there's an infinite dimensional symmetry uh, in the problem? From this point of view, you, you would expect it immediately because you have these measures which are trivially d logs. So there are zillions of diffeomorphisms, there are zillions of changes of variable that you can do on this that leave the measure invariant. Basically, any so-called positive diffeomorphism is a symmetry of the problem. Uh, and those positive diffeomorphisms are the origin of the Yangian symmetry directly. Okay, so, so you just, uh, you just, uh, uh, you just run into the Yangian without even uh, thinking about it from this point of view. Okay, so, um, and this is also, uh, you, I think you, you, you can think of this entire construction as in a sense the realization of the old S matrix program of using locality and unitarity to determine the amplitude. Okay? Except not doing it on the amplitude, which was hopeless, but doing it on the integrand as, our, as uh, Lanson's V and uh, David told us uh, uh, to do and to uh, focus on. So if you decide to sidestep and focus on the integrand and then but push the S matrix program of use locality, and, and I emphasize use because of the distinction I'm gonna make in a second, but use locality and unitarity to determine uh, the integrand, uh, then this is it, okay? Um, uh, at least for planar n equals four super Yang mills, this is it, and it has some payoffs. You see the symmetries, you see uh, you see this, uh, this beautiful connection to some, uh, uh, to some, uh, uh, to some new mathematics. Um, what you don't see, and this is a very important point, what you don't see is these pictures don't reproduce at loop level those beautiful box decompositions that uh, Lance and, and, and David gave us, because those things make locality manifest. Whereas the sort of whole point here is that these building blocks, term by term, aren't local. They can't have a local uh, space-time description. Now, it makes sense that they can't be local because their job is something else. They have to make all the symmetries manifest. And since the, there's two different symmetries in two different space-times, it would be crazy if you could do that in a local way. 
Okay? So we're, we're giving up something. We're giving up uh, representing the amplitude uh, in terms of local building blocks. But these are, the, these are the natural building blocks that see all the symmetries of the theory. All right. OK, so that's, the, uh, that's I think, the, that's, uh, in a sense, a sort of logical uh, completion of, uh, of Kutkowski to BDK, uh, n equals 4 super Yang Mills, um, and the on-shell determination of the integrand. Okay? Um, now, just my, my remaining five minutes, let me uh, just tell you a little bit about um, the next step. <clears throat> so now let me come back to ideology. <laughs> so, so this is all wonderful. Um, but uh, uh, but this, uh, uh, this did not conform to at least my own ideology in this business. Okay? Yeah. Because what I wanted to see um, was not just using locality and unitarity to determine the answer, but I wanted to see maybe locality and unitarity are themselves the answer to some other question. Okay? Or put another way, maybe the amplitudes are the answer to a different problem. Maybe there's a different question that you can ask. The amplitudes are the answer to the question, and then you can see uh, that the result is local and unitary without putting it in. Okay. And uh, these things were getting closer in the sense that we we're building the amplitude out of less familiar building blocks, and they weren't local, and so on and so forth. But uh, in the end of the day, what, tell, what tells us to take these individual on-shell pieces and glue them together uh, in this spe special way to get the answer? Well, it's a desire to make the answer local and unitary. Okay? It's really putting it in. Um, rather than seeing it come out in some, uh, rather than seeing it come out in some other way, and uh, and that's the that's uh, trying to find the sort of different question to which the amplitudes are the answer uh, was uh, was the uh, 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 was the question uh, Yaroslav Trenka and I have been pursuing for uh, for a number of years now, um, and and. What, what at least a conjectured proposal for the answer for planar n equals 4 super Yang Mills is that, uh, is, that, is that the amplitude or the integrand of the amplitude in a specific sense is to be thought of as the volume of some new mathematical object. Closely related to the positive Grassmannian, but it's not the positive Grassmannian, uh, which we call the amplitohedron. And so you can define what the sky is, you define what it is, and then you, uh, you try to compute its volume, its volume in quotes. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a funny notion of volume. Um, you have to find a certain form with uh, singularities on the boundaries of, of, of the space. But anyway, it's a well-defined, uh, it's a well-defined simple uh, mathematical object. I don't want to describe what it is in general, but let me just take, uh, but let me just show you what it, uh, how you think of it at four points. Okay. So uh, this is again all uh, planar n equals four super Yang Mills. Let's see how we think about it. Four points at L loops. I'm going to now define for you a 4L dimensional space. Okay. Uh, and the claim is that understanding this 4L dimensional space, where understanding means, uh, uh, in a literal sense, triangulating it. It's going to be some sort of big polyhedron type thing, although it has curvy sides. Okay. So, uh, so, so triangulating this, uh, this uh, polyhedron, uh, it's going to just correspond to computing the amplitude or computing the integrand for the uh, amplitude. Um, but let me just define, let me, let me define what, what the space is. Remember, at one loop, we have this nice expansion for A and B. So let me, let me write it as uh, in this way. Changing notation slightly. So with one loop variable, uh, uh, we had these nice, uh, I was calling them alpha, beta, gamma row before. Um, but, uh, so we have x, y, z, and w. Now if we have L loops, we just have a bunch of them. Okay. And so you see for each loop variable, we have four, for each loop we have four variables, x, y, z, and w. Okay. Now I'm going to carve out a part of x, y, z, w space. And the, Part of x, y, z, w space that I'm going to carve out is that x, i, y, i, z, i, w, i is positive. So that's, you see, it's related to positivity, in the, in the, uh, uh, but, uh, but in, in, a, in a somewhat different way. And 
<clears throat> xi minus xj, zi minus zj, plus yi minus yj, wi minus wj, is negative. Okay. So this is the uh, uh, amplitohedron for four particles at L loops. Okay, it's a subspace of this 4L dimensional space, specified by these uh, conditions. Okay. Uh, and <clears throat> uh, what is the integrand? The integrand is a form that has logarithmic singularities with 4L logarithmic singularities on all the boundaries of this space. In other words, as some of these equalities become saturated and you start hitting zero, you hit all the various boundaries, locally, everywhere it needs to look like a bunch of d logs, 4L d logs. Okay. So that's what defines what the integrand is. And so the best way of finding it is by covering the space with uh, what you might call positive coordinates. Cover it with patches, and each patch uh, x, y, z, w is a function of some variable that runs from zero to infinity, such that when you're in that patch, you're inside the amplitohedron, and then you have to find different ways of uh, patching them all together to get uh, to cover the whole space. If you manage to do that, then if you just sum the d logs of all the variables for each patch together, you have the integrand, because that's something that just puts logarithmic singularities on the boundaries of the whole space. Now. Uh, I won't have time to do, uh, to do an example, uh, to do a, uh, a, uh, a really non-trivial example, but something that should be clear is that nowhere in here does it seem like we're, even, we're drawing pictures, boxes, planar diagrams, nothing like that, right? It's the answer to this uh, geometry problem. And yet, the answer to this geometry problem turns out, in an emergent way, to actually have, the, to, to have uh, all that stuff uh, in it. Uh, just to, to take a simple example uh, uh, before I end, um, uh, as a warm-up to try to understand this whole space, you can understand some boundaries of the space. Um, uh, and the, the boundaries of the space correspond to computing cuts of the integrand. So let's say we put the uh, w's to zero. If, put the, uh, uh, if I put the uh, w's to zero, then uh, I've made that term zero. Uh, and now the space is really simple. It's xi minus xj, zi minus zj is less than zero. And so that means that if the x's are ordered in any way, the z's have got to be ordered in the opposite way. Okay, so that's what, what we learn already just in this very simple case. And now, now it's trivial to find a form that has logarithmic singularities on the boundary of this space. So it's just dx1 over x1. That just says that x1 is positive. Remember, they all have to be positive. But x2 is bigger than x1. x3 is bigger than x2. And so on. And then the z's just go the other way. And well, the y's, I didn't do anything to them. So that is now computed a cut. That, the claim is that that, that that computes a cut. Now, what cut have we computed? By putting the w to 0, I've made a lie on the line 1, 2. That means that AB intersects the line 1, 2, which means that each loop variable is cutting the top propagator, 1, 2. So this is, a, this is a particular cut of the integrand where every single loop variable is cutting 1, 2. Now, if you think in terms of boxes, uh, BDNK famously told us what these cuts are. These are the ladder diagrams. See, if you force everybody to cut that guy, then there's only one diagram that can possibly contribute, that one. Okay. And uh, there it is. Okay. That's, that's, that's the one diagram. And indeed, that form is exactly uh, the integrand cut along that guy. Okay. But you can now see that you can start relaxing these things in different ways. And you can compute infinite classes of cuts uh, non-diagrammatically. You're just studying what, this, uh, you're studying what this space looks like. But intriguingly, once again, you don't produce the answer in the local expansion form. Right? You produce it in another form, in terms of building blocks 
that uh, uh, in terms of elementary building blocks that have not just local poles, but spurious poles. All right, so, um, and uh, something that also comes out of this uh, picture, just studying this, uh, uh, studying what the boundaries of this space looks like, also tells you that, for example, if you take a double cut of one loop amplitude, uh, the space factorizes in two exactly as it needs to for unitarity. Okay. So this is, uh, uh, this is, again, taking, uh, but uh, just, just to say the connection now of the amplitohedron to a BDK, uh, this is taking generalized unitarity so seriously okay, that what the amplitohedron is is the object where every face of the amplitohedron is one of the cuts associated with generalized unitarity. And in fact, the circle of ideas I didn't tell you about that, that goes into a, uh, defining it, including the idea of positivity for external data, its purpose in life is to make it possible for every single singularity to be real. <coughs> Normally, they're all off in the complex plane. Every, sing, every single singularity of the amplitude is actually real and in, in your face. And the whole, as I said, the last five, six years of my, of my life have been, uh, have been in pursuit of understanding what generalized unitarity looks like when pushed to the extreme. And the amplitohedron is now an object that, uh, that, that, uh, that unifies all of the cuts together in one geometry. Okay? And the amplitude is the unique object which has these simple logarithmic singularities on it. All right, so uh, that's, uh, that's, that's, that's basically it. Um, let me just end by, uh, by saying um, that, uh, so here, of course, I've focused on uh, planar n equals four uh, super Yang Mills. Um, another very important feature of uh, Zvi, Lance, and David um, is that they've always been, uh, at least in the amplitudes business, way ahead of everyone else in the wilderness um, of, 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 of the field. Um, they know, I think, more about what's actually going on in scattering amplitudes for any question about amplitudes than anyone else uh, I know. Uh, if it's n equals four or n equals eight, uh, non-supersymmetric theories, uh, non-planar theories, gravity, uh, this beautiful double copy structure, and so on. Um, so, uh, and uh, for me personally, uh, all of the, so, and one thing that they've made extremely clear from all this work over the years is that the magic, there's a lot of magic in n equals four and even n equals eight, but there's magic everywhere. Okay? That there, there's this magic everywhere that, that, that lets them do these incredible calculations uh, of, of actual practical relevance to, to a collider physics experiments and seeing all this incredible structure and the rational terms and uh, all these beautiful things that have been uncovered over the years. I have to say that, that the fact that there seems to be magic everywhere, as, as, as exposed by them, played an enormous role for me personally, uh, at least speaking for myself, to get into the amplitudes business. Because uh, it's a funny thing for me to say, get, um, but uh, my attitude maybe five or six years ago, having not thought about it too uh, deeply, was oh, all the stuff for n equals four, it's just n equals four, who cares about n equals four? Obviously it's a very special theory, who gives a damn, there's all this special fancy stuff going on, big whoop. It's probably very special properties of n equals four. Um, and it was the fact that uh, it was hard to ignore uh, all this obvious incredible structure that was showing up, not just in n equals four, um, in ordinary QCD, these uh, remarkable connections between gauge theory and gravity that have nothing to do with supersymmetry, they're true in any number of dimensions. There's all this stuff going on, which is just totally hidden in the usual way of thinking about field theory, which, uh, which, have, been, uh, uh, which have been exposed um, by our friends uh, here over the past number of years. And that, that played a, an essential role uh, as I said, for, for me to uh, get into this business. Because th this, 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 uh, this ideology that I begin all these talks with, um, there's, of course, there's a, there's a, there's a secret, there's a secret, not so secret, but uh, there's, there's a second obvious reason why something like this should be going on, which is that screw all the highfalutin crap. There's this incredible stuff under our feet in the structure of the amplitudes. And to my thinking, the fact that uh, that, that, that magic persists all over the place, uh, together with these at least vague motivation from, these, uh, from, from the highfalutin point of view that we might want to find uh, a space-time free way of thinking about uh, amplitudes and field theory in general uh, makes this an incredibly uh, interesting uh, subject to uh, think about and uh, work on. And, um, and obviously we've been taking lots of inspiration uh, from, from, from the uh, 
uh, amazing structure that, 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 that's been seen even at n equals four superangular nulls beyond the planar limit. Um, I have zero time to uh, talk about it, but that's something that actually uh, was done, uh, or was started uh, uh, here at the Simon Center uh, about a, a month, month and a half ago, um, is, is, is starting to understand, at least for uh, n equals four, beyond the planar limit, in the very minimal case of, of MHV uh, non-planar on shell diagrams. MHV non-planar on shell diagrams seem to be associated with, uh, with positivity in an even more powerful way than the planar case. So it seems like there's a positive structure in the, there's a, there's a positive structure in the Grassmannian associated with non-planar amplitudes. In fact, even planar amplitudes have not just one positive structure, but n minus one factorial positive structures associated with them. And we've just been focusing on one of them. The presence of the other guys is responsible for the wonderful identities that are satisfied between different cyclic orderings, at least. Uh, so between different cyclic orderings. So, so you want decoupling uh, uh, KK identities, uh, hopefully BCJ, although that's something that, that we don't understand. So that's, that's one thing, just going back to the story of gluing these things together, which you can do even if the diag uh, diagrams aren't planar, that's something very interesting, and at least in the MHV case, seems to be associated with an extended notion of positivity. And another, of course, wonderful fact is that there's leading transcendentality, even beyond n equals four, which, and that was the purpose of this uh, thing, which you can start trying to make manifest by taking the, for example, two-loop non-planar integrand, as computed by our friends, and trying to make it again, trying to do to it what we did with the, uh, the one-loop and the other examples, casting it in a manifestly uh, d log form. And in fact, if you take, so, so the, ordinarily the answer is given in terms of uh, diagrams that look like this uh, summed over all permutations and dressed with the corresponding uh, color factors. If you actually take the answer as given uh, by, by you guys, uh, each individual term in that sum uh, uh, doesn't, have, uh, uh, um, doesn't have uniform transcendentality, but the sum works out. But there's a way of uh, reshuffling things around such that each term individually has uh, uniform transcendentality, and here it is. Okay? So, so that term dressed with its color factor is dressed with eight D logs. Okay? So it's in, uh, it's in uh, okay? Um, and you'll notice something interesting, that the coefficients the coefficients in front of these guys are not just one Park Taylor factor, but there are sums in this case of, of uh, Park Taylor factors in different orderings. Uh, that's a general fact about all MHV amplitudes we claim. Is that the thing? Yeah. Local tensor integral? Yes, this is local tensor integral. Yes, this is an absolutely local tensor integral. And, uh, and I should have said, even from the point of view, uh, so even going back to the planar case and talking about the amplitohedron, despite the fact that our current understanding of how to sort of triangulate or cellulate the amplitohedron doesn't produce local forms, we strongly suspect there's some other way of triangulating it that directly produces local forms. And it's because, A, the local forms are so simple and beautiful, there had better be. And B, the local forms make something manifest about the answer, a certain positivity property of the final answer, which is actually completely mysterious from, from any other uh, point of view. So there, there, there are multiple reasons to suspect that even in the planar n equals four case, there was something missing. Uh, and that, uh, and that, that, that there, there is another feature of the geometry that will directly produce these beautiful formulas with the boxes and tennis courts and so on, okay? Um, but uh, uh, so uh, I think a, a very provisional conjecture, um, or hope, I wouldn't even call it a conjecture, but, but something that we are pursuing is that, um, uh, is that it could be that, 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 that positivity really has something to do with uh, uniform transcendentality, d log structure, and is not restricted to the planar theory, but is something that, uh, that is really a property of uh, n equals four uh, super Yang mills itself. Um, and anyway, there's a very, very long way to go to put more meat on those bones, but uh, it's starting to make sense for leading singularities, and it's certainly an exercise that we can start trying to carry out uh, at the level of the uh, wonderful data which has been uh, uh, produced in the literature by our friends. All right, so, um, so uh, that's it uh, for the physics. Let me just uh, say uh, just a few quick personal remarks because uh, there are uh, um, uh, Lance and, and Zvi and David's uh, intellectual personalities have done uh, so much to draw people uh, in, into the subject. I, 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 of course, knew them all um, personally uh, since long before working on uh, uh, scattering amplitudes myself. I think I knew Lance the longest since I was a postdoc uh, at, at Slack, 
Uh, one of many reasons I hate four component notation is that uh, uh, had I known about lambdas and lambda tildes back then, I would have probably started working on, uh, on, on scattering amplitudes <laughs> already in 1990, 1999 because I, I was so amazed about what was going on, but it seemed like you had to be a, a four by four matrix genius in order to do anything with this, with this business. Um, and of course, uh, I think I, I, I interacted with, with, with Zvi a little uh, after that when he was giving some, uh, some lectures on N equals A supergravity and asked him all kinds of dumb questions that he answered very nicely. Now I realize the dumbness of the questions I was asking. I'm impressed with how nice he was with the answers. Um, and, uh, and David is actually my academic uncle. Um, and, uh, and I will resent him to the end of my days. Because, uh, if, if, because if, it, if it wasn't for David, I would be the only person in the world who used to be a Moose model builder who now works on scattering amplitudes. <laughs> but, uh, but David beat me to it by a long, long way. So, uh, uh, so, um, but, uh, um, uh, but, but I, I, I really have to say that, uh, uh, that all three of you have, have done an amazing job welcoming, uh, first drawing people into the subject with uh, the amazingly exciting work that you've done, and also welcoming all of us newcomers, uh, tolerating all those super simple dumb questions, uh, never making us feel super simple and dumb when we ask them, and, uh, and doing uh, an incredible job um, uh, to, uh, uh, to, to, to grow this uh, amazing subject. Uh, the, the field exists largely due uh, to your work. Um, and um, uh, I'd like to just thank the three of you on behalf of not just myself, but, but, but the whole field, and, and, and congratulate you on, on the wonderful uh, uh, news of your prize. See, you don't give a crap about all the, <laughs> all the like, uh, <laughs> yeah, space science strategy, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 No, we, we, we talked about this uh, before. Yeah, so I think this is a really interesting, uh, I think this is a really interesting thing. No, so, um, so, um, so of course we can do that for uh, n equals eight at two loops as well, um, um, and it works. In both cases, going from your guys' formula to these d-log forms requires either the color identity or s plus t plus u equals zero, obviously. Um, now, uh, we don't know how to do it at three loops yet. I mean, we've done everything uh, uh, except uh, we, as Yara, has done everything except uh, uh, the, the famous terrible uh, three-loop crossed, whatever you call it. Uh, diagram, huh? The window, the window diagram, right? But but we suspect it's it's possible. So, but I think that this is a uh, this is something I think this is something interesting to do with the uh, n equals eight uh, uh, finiteness question, um, which is not just pushing higher loops, but just trying to see whether it's true that the existing answers to three and four loops actually have uniform transcendentality or not. And getting at the level of computing the final answer would be wonderful, but you, we can even mess around with it at the level of the integrand and try to bring it to a d-log form. And now, there isn't a proof, I should say, I, I, not, I didn't mean to uh, suggest this, but there isn't actually a proof that if you put it in d-log form, that means that it has the correct transcendentality. But it seems true, and it seems like a very special property of the integrand that should be reflected in some very special property of the answer, which is likely its uh, uniform uh, transcendentality. Um, so, so that's, I think, uh, something really interesting. So if the three-loop answer, let's say, let's say it's true that, uh, that you start seeing non-uniform transcendentality pieces, then I would bet that things are bad for finiteness, okay? Because uh, eventually, you know, you, you go from uh, uh, polylogs to a logarithm, and then that's, there's the divergence. But it might, it might be, I mean, if it happens, it might be an example of something that would build up gradually. Like maybe it's fine at two loops, and at three loops you have a transcendentality drop one, four loops two, I don't know how it would work. But you might imagine that eventually uh, you, hit a, uh, you have a sort of growing problem that, that, that hits you at high enough loop order. But I think that's, uh, but regardless of whether or not that, that's true, at four points, higher points, I think uh, uh, one thing that, that we all know well is, uh, in, is, is the bugaboo of the non-planar world is precisely what we mean by the integrand. I mean, there, there is an there extremely powerful, obviously, everything that you guys have done shows that there is a very useful and powerful notion of integrand. On the other hand, there isn't a formally defined notion of integrand, of something that's God-given by summing Feynman diagrams. So what is the integrand exactly? And that's something abstractly many of us have tried to uh, work out. 
But um, maybe you know, maybe someone knows, but uh, um, I, I don't know. I would love to know. Um, but, but, but perhaps instead of uh, futzing around with that, just staring at these results uh, and trying to put them in, in, in D log form would give some, some, some insight into what we're supposed to uh, uh, think about. But uh, yeah, but. Uh, but. Loops. Yes, everything but 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 the window. Uh, yes, but the, uh, yeah, but the window. Yeah, yeah, kind of uh, yeah. So um, uh, not from our point of view, because what, what, I mean, uh, even from the even from the so what the what the amplitohedron gives you is the question to which the l loop integrand is the answer okay and so you 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 find this geometry in this uh, in this nice space and it's the and it's and it's the volume of course we can formally sum them up together but that's 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 that, that's not yeah yeah so so what 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 we don't yet know is what the non perturbative question is to which that's 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 the answer yeah right I just want at, at that level there is sure at that level there is but I think that's not uh, yeah at that at that level there is yeah yes yeah maybe yeah no at that level there is but 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 I think uh, but that's uh, I mean you can make a generating function out of these things it's all it's all fine and you can see um, yeah at that level there is but it's still not I mean I, I would love to have a really non perturbative definition of what 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 the object is and um, and I should say that uh, I think. I think the, the, the key obstacle, just, I say this just because we keep running into this fact, you know, the, when there's one exactly the same problem that you can't avoid for two or three years and you keep circling around it, um, there's got to be something to it. Uh, there's something about getting to these local forms. And it's related to, it's related to finding, I, I, I told you that, that, uh, that we have the space and we have to find a form with logarithmic singularities on the boundary of the space. But we would really rather have a very literal volume rather than uh, the sort of dual notion of volume, which is really what, what we have. I think all these things are somehow, I suspect, are related to each other. If we had this dual notion of volume, if we, uh, which would give us a sort of local, which would be associated with having local forms, I think it would let us carry out the integrations in some formal way, you put all the objects together. I think that's what's, uh, I think at least from my point of view, that's what's, uh, that's the missing link in uh, connecting uh, this business to uh, the amplitude more more directly. And of course, there's been uh, as as an example of the non-ideological nature of our of our friends that having uh, having pioneered thinking about the integrand for uh, 20 years, uh, at least for some questions, they don't give a crap about the integrand anymore. Why do you care about the integrand when you can just get the amplitude directly, right? You know, it's, uh, some some uh, right. So uh, so, uh, but but I think there is a point of life. There there is a point to having the integrand. Which is really what we went back to right, right, right in the beginning. It, without the integrand, seeing the unitarity and locality of the final result is always going to be somewhat mysterious, right? It's like back in the S matrix program. So I think somehow what's really needed is some is some way to go from formally the integrand to some other object, um, and uh, and uh, and use the connection to the integrand to establish that it's local and unitary and use the other object to uh, carry out the uh, computations. But that's still pretty futuristic. Uh, George. Oh, yeah. well, coming back to unitary, going all the way back to Kowski, what happens if you have a unitary in the normal picture is imposed by I epsilon. Right. A prescription for right. the chain. Absolutely. Is there a sense of that here? When we no, in fact, in fact, so th th this, th there's something kind of cool about this because, uh, because it, especially in this in this ge geometric pictures that I was talking about at the end, the geometry is very naturally living in two comma two signature. Okay, so we so we have some object, we have this form, it has these beautiful singularity properties. Uh, you see, you can talk about those singularity properties without any i epsilons, right? So that's great. You have this form. In fact, it's most natural in 2-2 two -two signature. In 2-2 two -two signature, it doesn't have any temporal causal interpretation or unitary interpretation. In fact, these quote unquote amplitudes end up all being real. So they're definitely not amplitudes. I mean, they don't have phases in them. They're all real. Somehow, uh, that, so the, the, the geometry lives in 2-2 two -two signature. But when you analytically continue to 3-1 signature, then the i epsilons matter. And then, a la Kutkowski, these factorization properties imply unitarity. 
Okay? So, my, so, my, so, so I think that the, the sort of picture might end up being really read backwards. You have this, uh, just like for a long time we were used to thinking about field theory in, for, for correlation functions and other questions, field theory lives in Euclidean space and then you analytically continue to Minkowski space to get interesting physical answers. It could be that amplitudes live in 2-2 two -two signature uh, from this point of view and you have to continue them to a 3-1. And, and these, these sort of geometric properties that give you uh, uh, the factorization pictures, what we call locality and unitarity a la Kutkowski, uh, uh, as you continue to 3 1, allow these objects to have a causal and unitary interpretation. But the fact that it's causal and unitary is then something which, of course, the I epsilons are, 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 are crucial for. Two? Sorry? Two twos? Uh, oh, you. you Where are they? Oh, uh, you, you mean where do the where do the two two signature come in? Yeah. Oh, it's because it's because in all everything here where we're talking about positive variables, they all in particular have to be real. And the second they're real, we're working with real twister variables, and it's all two two signature at that point. You you talked about constructing the integrand. What about the integral? Uh, well, that's just what that's just what we're talking about. A a. a uh, 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 a moment ago. The, 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 that, that's one of the great, of course, that's one of the great innovations about thinking about the integrand. You don't have to worry about all that stuff, right? That the integrand is a beautiful rational function, and then you can defer to the end uh, the questions about how to regulate it. Now, if you want to regulate it with, uh, if you want to regulate it with dim reg, you have to think harder about mu terms, and you have to think about exactly how much, uh, uh, exactly how to take the four-dimensional information and whether you really need new information beyond n equals QCD, you need new information in order to be able to determine them. Um, in the context of n equals 4, there are physical infrared regulators, like going out along the Coulomb branch. And then, then of course, everything is perfectly four-dimensional and fine, and, and, and of course, people have worked out how to, how to do that. Um, but, uh, but um, um, yeah, so, so, so I think uh, you, you, you uh, I think the, the attitude is not to look a gift horse in the mouth. Uh, so that there, there is something, there is something extremely beautiful about this integrand. It's a God-given four-dimensional object, and it may not be enough to get the full answer because of subtleties having to do with infrared divergences sometimes in four minus epsilon dimensions and rational terms and so on. Um, but somehow, uh, I, it sounds like a good idea to uh, understand this beautiful God-given object properly, um, and then try to see how it connects to a, uh, to the yeah, edge you care about. Yeah. What motivated the mathematicians to? Oh, you would not believe it. It's well, actually, uh, it's 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 pretty interesting. Uh, there, even many different mathematicians uh, came at it from from different points of view. For example, our two collaborators, uh, Posnikov and Goncharov, had uh, had very different points of view before getting into it. Posnikov's point of view was, um, funnily enough, they they both have some field theory connection, although Posnikov's is pretty uh, pretty distant. There, there's an old problem of resistor networks. Right? You know, imagine you just, have a, you, you just have a black box with wires sticking out of it, and all you get to do is measure the resistances on the outside. What can you conclude about what the resistor network looks like inside? Right? And then there's various moves you can do on, 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 on the network of resistors to give you the same answer, blah, 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 blah. Okay? So th th there's a whole beautiful story there. And Posnikov wanted to generalize that from resistors to directed graphs. Okay? And uh, so he had this thing that he called boundary measurements, which are you have the wire sticking out, but you have black and white vertices, and so on and so forth. So that led him to construct these big k by n matrices, depending on edge variables. And then he started noticing that you got all positive minors, and so on and so forth. So I mean, it was a that was a it was a it was a sort of out of the way uh, motivation. Gontrov's motivation, in a sense, is closer. Um, and uh, I maybe uh, uh, should have said this. Uh, let's say someone told you to go try to build big k by n matrices where all the ordered minors are positive. That sounds like a hard problem. I mean, it's a very non nonlinear non problem. How would you go about building a gigantic k by n matrix? In other words, how do you parameterize it with variables such that it's guaranteed for all the minors to be positive? And the nice way of thinking about it is to not look at it, just not try to do it in one shot, but to try to build up the big k by n matrix by gluing together little matrices. Okay. And that process, uh, Fock and Goncharov called amalgamation. Okay? So that's exactly what they did. They, they took teeny tiny little uh, uh, G13s and G23s, and they glued them together. In a, and, and the gluing process manifestly preserved positivity, and they then gradually built up these big positive matrices from little ones. Ne needless to say, 
that, uh, that operation, which is very natural mathematically for trying to build up a big positive matrices, is precisely the gluing together black and white vertices to make on-shell diagrams. So that's, uh, so that's uh, but uh, of course, what, what they did not have is external data, right? So they just had the structure purely in the Grassmannian. We get the structure in the Grassmannian and external data as well. And in a sense, the, 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 the sort of pr our previous story with the amplitudes in the positive Grassmannian was marrying the external data of the problem in a sort of very, in a very heavy handed way. Basically, all the action was going on in the Grassmannian, and then you just multiply by some simple delta function to convert it into uh, functions of the external data. And the amplitohedron story treats the external data much more symmetrically, on a much more symmetrical footing to everything else. Uh, and, but, but then it changes the, uh, the, 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 the geometry of something else. Any last question? Not that. Thank you again. Thank you.